Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I'm very pleased to bring you part one of my next series, which is on avian gross pathology. This series will take a system by system look at diseases of birds. We're going to focus primarily on poultry, chickens, and turkeys. We'll also look at some of the common diseases of the lesser known poultry, like ducks and pheasants, and zoo and wildlife birds as well. Part one is going to focus on the cardiovascular system. And before I start this lecture, before I start this series of lectures, I want to thank all of those friends and colleagues who have provided images to me over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. For the little that I know about avian pathology, the person who I respect most in this area is Dr. Rob Porter from the University of Minnesota. He's been an outstanding friend. He's been a mentor in this area for me. He has willingly shared his images, not just with me, but with students and veterinarians around the world. If you ever get a chance to meet him, to get a copy of the CD that he has produced with his own images, a number of which I've incorporated into this lecture, it's a fantastic way to learn poultry pathology. He also is ACVP boarded in anatomic pathology, so he knows pathology of all species. Just a great guy, a great pathologist, and unfortunately for him, a fan of the Cleveland Indians baseball team. Rob, thank you so much for all your help over the years, all the work that you've done for the foundation. And then under Rob are a number of other veterinarians who for this lecture, Cardiovascular Pathology, provided me images either through online collections or directly over the years. And without all the help of a large number of pathologists on, around the world, I would not be able to put these lectures together. So with all of that said, I'm going to move on. We're going to look at the surprising number of diseases that hit the heart and the vessels of avian species. The first image is a great image and a great dissection by Dr. Kim Newkirk of the University of Tennessee. It always amazes me when I see these pictures, how they can take the, uh, the ribs off without puncturing the very enlarged pericardium here. This is a condition that we're going to see again when we talk in the gastrointestinal tract about the diseases of liver. Um, because it is sort of a combined disease which is caused by an avian adenovirus, which causes two distinct diseases which are often seen in concert. The one we're looking at is hydropericardium syndrome, but it also goes hand in hand with inclusion body hepatitis, both caused by the same adenovirus. And so people now call them hydropericardium and inclusion body hepatitis syndrome. This disease, which is caused by avian adenoviruses, formerly group one adenoviruses, causes high mortality in young broiler birds and is associated with anemia, hemorrhage, and hydropericardium. The most common viruses associated in this group are serotypes four and eight, which can cause a disease without the concurrent immunosuppressive effects of infectious bursal disease, which is occasionally seen in association with this disease. Here's another picture of hydropericardium and this disease from Tom Sasir of Virginia Tech University. Now back to the condition. This usually causes sudden mortality of between 20 to 70 percent in chickens less than six weeks old and some as young as four days of age. The amount of mortality is based on the severity of the particular virus as well as the presence of any other immunosuppressive agents. We talked about uh, the burner virus that causes infectious bursal disease, also chickenemia agent could immunosuppress and cause a higher mortality as well. Histologic lesions would include myocardial edema and often inclusion bodies within areas of necrosis in the liver. We're going to talk a little bit more about inclusion body hepatitis when we get to the gastrointestinal tract. So hydropericardium, think about aviadenoviruses. Okay, 
I love this next picture. It's a great picture and illustrates that the things we talk about in pathology for mammals also affect birds as well. And we are looking at the heart of a duckling. And the heart is covered with fibrin. And whenever you think about fibrin within potential spaces, like the pericardial space, I want you to think about septicemia. And this is a classic septicemic disease, which is caused by Rhymorella and Adipestifer in ducklings. It's known as new duck disease. And I don't think there's anything new about this disease. It was diagnosed many, many, many years ago, but I think the new refers to the fact that it does affect ducklings. New duck disease affects birds between the ages of one to eight weeks uh, of age, and it's a classic septicemia, which is caused by gram-negative bacteria. Rhymorella, anything that ends in L is probably gram-negative, used to be pasturella anatopestifer, anatopestifer uh, meaning duck, a duck plague. Let's not confuse that with duck plague. We'll talk about that when we get into the GI system too. But it causes septicemia. It causes fibrin throughout the body, uh, polycerositis, and the animals uh, experience diarrhea, anorexia, coughing, and you can see neurologic abnormalities and ocular signs probably from the meningitis that you see. Okay, so at autopsy, you will see fibrin throughout the body, a, a fibrinous polycerositis, which looks a little bit like cholebacillosis in, uh, in broiler chickens. It's not just a disease of uh, ducks. It can also be seen less frequently in uh, geese, uh, occasionally turkeys, chickens, and pheasants as well. Once this uh, condition becomes established in a farm, it can be the devil to get rid of. Okay, in just about every species, when we talk about bacterial diseases of the heart, we do talk about fibrinosuppurative valvulitis or vegetative valvular endocarditis. In most species, in poultry as well, uh, Staphylococcus uh, and coliforms are always uh, present in the environment, and if they have access to the circulatory system, especially in immunosuppressed animals, can result in vegetative valvular endocarditis. Um, I would also add a couple, as I do in many different species, um, that will cause uh, vegetative valvular endocarditis in poultry. Erysipelas thrix rusiopathy um, will certainly do that in uh, poultry. We also know that it does that in dogs as well. It's one of those viruses we're going to talk about more at the end of this lecture. It likes to cause thrombosis throughout the body, and if it attaches to the valves, will cause presence of uh, accumulation of fibrin and uh, inflammatory debris. Salmonella we're going to talk about in just a moment. Also, the host adapted ones will go after the heart. And uh, usually I say it's staph strep and E. coli. I'm not saying streptococcus, but uh, enterococcus, especially enterococcus fecalis, uh, is a good substitute for strep in poultry. It's been well known to cause endocarditis in chickens, hepatic granulomas in turkeys. Um, Long-term infection can result in uh, systemic amyloidosis, including amyloidosis of the joints, which is sort of an interesting thing. So enterococcus fecalis rather than streptococcus is a cause of vegetative valvular endocarditis in poultry. Okay, here's a somewhat unusual disease attacking the heart and other organs in poultry, and this is a host-adapted salmonella known as salmonella pylorum. Now, salmonella pylorum causes pylorum disease. There's a very similar agent called salmonella gallinorum, which traditionally has been thought to cause foul typhoid disease, more disease of older animals with uh, salmonella pylorum primarily affecting chicks and poults. Um, over the last couple of years, um, they have been combined under one species, Salmonella enterica, subspecies enterica, 
Pallorum Gallinarum. Um, and there's ongoing debate as if they are one or two different servars. So it might be the same agent with uh, different manifestations in different age birds. They are host adapted salmonella, so as we know from previous lectures, they primarily cause septicemic disease rather than enteric disease. And pylorum disease is an acute systemic disease of chicks and poults where you will see pyogranulomatous inflammation in a number of organs, uh, including and characteristically within the myocardium. And you can see these sort of white pyogranulomas within the myocardium, very very uh, characteristic of pylorum disease. Something else that you can see in affected birds is a severe fibrinous endocarditis, or excuse me, a pericarditis. And of course, we also want to think about any other gram-negative agent, salmonella being gram-negative agent, but it's often seen in association with pylorum disease in chicks. The pyogranulomas can be seen in a number of uh, of different organs. Here's the spleen, and we have the same foci, pyogranulomas disease. You can see it in the liver, in the ovary, in many different organs. It is a, a systemic disease, and uh, but very characteristically will cause white nodules within the heart, and that's a bit of a giveaway. Did you know that birds can get heartworms? They're a little different. And uh, this is one called Sarcanema uricerca, and as opposed to heartworms in uh, dogs, which live in the pulmonary arteries, you actually get migration of the uh, adult filarids through the myocardium as well. Over time, with a large infection, you will see large hemorrhagic migration tracts through the myocardium, and ultimately, when you get a heavy burden of the parasites, which are more often seen in, uh, in waterfowl, such as swans, um, you will get so much uh, necrosis of the myocardium that the animal can go into heart failure. Okay, now let's move away from the infectious disease affecting the heart and look at a couple of other diseases that affect the heart in birds. Here's a broiler chick, um, and you can see that the abdomen is greatly distended by the accumulation of a serous transidate. This is ascites, and this is known as uh, ascites syndrome or round heart disease in broiler chickens. Not uncommon in broiler chickens, especially those raised at high altitudes, and there's a lot of uh, different potential causes, multifactorial causes of this particular condition. Um, mortality uh, can approach 1% to 2% or greater in uh, some flocks. It often is associated with broiler chickens that are bred for high feed efficiency and uh, a rapid rate of growth and muscle development, which is the way broilers are, are primarily produced. We want to get them to market as quickly as uh, uh, as as we can. And so we push them for a high rate of gain, we feed them high energy feed, and we have a rapid increase in muscle mass, which gives you a high oxygen demand for muscle growth. And these birds have smaller lungs than their ancestors or even other types of chickens. So uh, there's a tremendous pressure on uh, the on the heart in terms of a uh, mild hypoxia, so the animals increase cardiac output. And ultimately, we end up with right-sided heart failure in some birds and the accumulation of ascites. These animals may die suddenly. Uh, they were previously healthy in the, at three to five weeks, um, and they're gaining weight well, and then all of a sudden, um, they die. Grossly, in addition to the ascites, which is not a difficult uh, uh, sign to pick up, you might see uh, uh, cyanotic combs and wattles. The lungs are going to be sort of a demitis and dark red, and you may also see hydropericardium as well. 
when we look at the heart boy look at here's a left ventricle and look how sort of thin the right ventricle is how the uh, right ventricular chamber is markedly dilated so there's been you know a push in these in these growers to try and reduce the incidence of this they will decrease the energy level in the feed they'll use restricted feeding they reduce lighting a little bit due to the growing period it's just one of those diseases we get because we try and push these animals to market as well and, and as quickly as possible now it's not restricted uh, simply to chickens turkeys also get a condition known as round heart disease look at the size of that heart this is a bit more of a spontaneous cardiomyopathy in young commercial turkeys um, and the cause is not really known it may have a a genetic a predisposition in some lines and and may be complicated by hypoxia uh, in the incubator when the animals are very young uh, some people have incriminated a uh, uh, an increased level of salt in the ration and when we look at the hearts of these birds they look uh, very similar to that in the chicken, you have marked right ventricular dilatation, right-sided heart failure, and resultant ascites. The animals will die often without uh, premonitory signs. There is a low mortality to the and, and once again, it's a complication that might have a genetic predisposition, certainly uh, early rapid growth rate, um, pushing the animals into a hypoxic state. Uh, round heart disease has also been described uh, in ducks and uh, Dr. John Van Vliet back in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s incriminated uh, furazolidone, uh, which was a, uh, an antibiotic that was given to these animals and caused myocardial necrosis. So that's another type of cardiomyopathy that was drug-induced. Okay, let's move on. Look at another uh, pretty common disease of uh, uh, all sorts of birds. You also see it in reptiles. And this white flaky material that is seen on the epicardium is not fibrin like we saw in new duct disease or other forms of septicemia, but is actually urate deposition and resultant granulomatous inflammation and is known as visceral gout. It might be seen in the pericardial space, it might be seen in the celomic cavity covering the liver or other areas of the celom. And, uh, and it's a combination of dehydration and elevated urate concentration in the blood. Okay. And you can do that by pushing a lot of proteins. These animals are often uh, on, on a high protein ration, but also they are dehydrated. And you will always see gout in even the best uh, commercial facility because there are going to be animals that are weaker, that might have uh, damage to a leg or something, that can't get to the waterers. Because remember, you have 4,000 birds in one facility, and it's sort of a battle in there to get to the water. So the weaker or smaller birds won't get that. And these are ones that, that may give you your 1% um, rate of gout. And remember that uh, the end product of uh, renal filtration in the in mammals is urea, and in, uh, in birds it's uric acid. Gout is impaired excretion by the kidneys, and it will precipitate um, in the kidneys especially, but then will also precipitate on the serous membranes of other, uh, of other organs, which we call visceral gout. The uric acid crystals will uh, result in a uh, inflammatory response. There will be fibrin. There will be uh, epithelioid multinucleated cells around it. And uh, these tissues, when you fix them to look at them, the alcohol will dissolve the uric acid. So you have these empty sort of spicular clefts, which are surrounded by granulomous inflammation. Very characteristic. 
before you get out. Make sure you check those kidneys because it's always going to be there before it spills over into the, uh, the rest of the viscera. Oftentimes, it looks quite flaky. Sometimes, it looks a little gooier almost like pus. Remember, birds don't make a lot of pus. Their heterophils don't contain myeloperoxidase, so they're not big pus formers. They tend to make granulomatous inflammation. So you see something sort of gooey like that, don't say it's pus. It is going to be gout. When we get to diseases of the musculoskeletal system, we're going to talk about articular gout, which it shows up in the joints. It's a different pathogenesis, not associated with uh, dehydration and impaired excrement of uric acid, as visceral and renal gout are. Okay, well, not all the diseases affecting the heart are going to be in poultry unless you are eating parrots. Um, but a very uh, common lesion in older citizens um, are these yellowish plaques in the vessels, especially the, uh, the great vessels of the heart, occasionally you see it in the coronary vessels, and it's yellow. And when we think about the diseases that we can see in other domestic species like uh, uh, primates, um, when we see yellow plaques in the great vessels, I want you to think about atherosclerosis. Uh, in, in parrots, it's considered a geriatric condition. Um, you know, people like to feed all sorts of stuff to parrots, so I would assume that over a course of a lifetime they get all sorts of things that they should be eating, eating sort of like people. Um, and it's seen um, in a number of species, blue-fronted Amazons, macaws, and especially African gray parrots. And African grays can start earlier on this than the other species of parrots. Uh, it usually starts on the right aortic arch. Um, and these animals, if you measure their blood, you may see lipemia and marked elevations in cholesterol and triglycerides as well. And uh, ultimately, it may result in uh, decreased blood supply because of the uh, dilation or the enlargement of these uh, vessels. They don't distend well. The lumen will be markedly encroached upon by these plaques. So initially you get subclinical, then you get a clinical decreased blood supply to the, uh, to the brain and, uh, and the pectoral muscles as well. And it might be severe enough to result in the death of the bird. Here's another picture from an African gray parrot, and you can see the very prominent coronary vessels. You can see the very prominent uh, branches of the great vessels here. So atherosclerosis, a problem in aging citizens. It's not just citizens as well. You can see it in a couple of other birds. This is uh, atherosclerosis in an ostrich, giving you these very characteristic yellowish plaques. Okay, we're moving on to some of the uh, some of the vessel lesions that we will see in animals, and here is a very pale turkey. It's a little bit of blood coming out of the mouth, out of the nostrils, and turkeys are well known for aortic ruptures. This particular condition may be seen in fast-growing turkeys at any age above uh, eight weeks, often seen between 12 and 16 weeks, um, and more often seen in males than females. This is something that uh, is probably going to end up um, to be genetic. These animals may show initial hypertension before they, and they might even have dissecting aneurysms before it ruptures. There's a couple of places that ruptures uh, in the area of the kidney is a good spot. Here we're looking at a rupture between the external iliac and the ischiatic arteries. And a lot of things over the years have been identified or considered causative in turkeys. A lot of them have not been uh, 
been proven, copper deficiency, hormonal influences, zinc deficiencies, uh, parasites, um, all have been incriminated at one point. It may be a multifactorial condition in which genetics will play a significant role. Here's a nice picture by uh, Dr. Guillermo Rimoldi showing a, uh, a linear tear here in the aorta at the origin of the celiac artery. Uh, this is also uh, seen in large birds like, his, like emus and ostriches as well. And ultimately will probably prove to be multifactorial as well. We know about the genetics, we know about the hypertension. All the other things are probably still in play. Uh, here's a great picture from Dan Shaw showing uh, coronary arterial rupture in commercial turkeys. So remember genetics, remember hypertension, that is usually involved. And then uh, uh, think about the various uh, elements within the diet that, uh, that may contribute to something like this. Low levels of copper, zinc, etc., and, uh, and I guess this will eventually be figured out. Okay, now I want to talk about a hemorrhagic disease of great importance here. And I put it in, in the vascular part of the lectures because it's most commonly characterized by hemorrhages. And if you see this particular lesion, which is hemorrhages um, over the lymphoid follicles in the proventriculus. It's a very characteristic condition or, or, or gross sign of a hemorrhagic disease known as visceral velogenic Newcastle's disease. Newcastle disease is a viral disease caused by a paramyx of virus which affects a wide range of birds and is complicated by a number of different presentations as well as some significant variations in viral strength. The images I'm going to show you are from the uh, velogenic or the most severe kind. Realize they're also lentogenic which may cause absolutely no signs at all. There is a mesogenic, which generally causes respiratory signs and occasionally nerve signs with, with low mortality. And then, then we have the viscerotropic velogenic forms, which cause hemorrhages throughout the body. Now, when we think about uh, these diseases and diseases that cause hemorrhages throughout the body, um, you need to consider the possibility of pastoral multocida, a hot gram negative that will cause a lot of hemorrhage that is not uncommon in this country does not uh, uh, raise the level of alarm that uh, VVND would, and also some forms of avian influenza. I decided to put v uh, Newcastle's disease in with cardiovascular because it it is a virus that affects endothelium in a large number of organs. You'll have very characteristic hemorrhages throughout the body. This is a classic one proventricular hemorrhage. Not a lot of things are going to cause that, so that should set off alarm bells in your head. But the, the hemorrhages will be seen throughout the body. Hemorrhages within the intestinal tract are, uh, are very characteristic. Some of these animals will just have widespread hemorrhage within the respiratory tract. The GI tract, here is the trachea as well. And it is a systemic disease um, absolutely devastating is uh, can be transmitted by caged birds, backyard chickens, anything that's imported from other countries. We keep a very close eye. This is a reportable disease, so even suspect cases um, should be reported to local authorities. As you would expect with uh, animals that uh, have severe hemorrhage, the animals are going to be uh, uh, very pale, okay, they will have sort of this sleepy appearance or, or they may be neurologic because the virus can, can cause neurologic signs as well due to damage of the endothelium in the brain. 
you'll see conjunctival hemorrhage as well in animals that survive or even in the acute stages may manifest the neurologic disease like you would see this. You would also have to think about avian influenza for something like this as well. But a lot of hemorrhages, uh, if it's not poultry, you know, uh, you can see a lot of hemorrhages in, in uh, a wild birds or something like that. And I tend to think a little more of Pastorella multocida. But when you're thinking about poultry, you have to think about the big three for these, these severe systemic diseases, uh, visceral velotropic Newcastle disease, avian influenza, which we're going to cover in the next lecture, uh, under the respiratory system, and then pastoral multasta, which also is called foul cholera, which we're going to see in a number of lectures, including uh, the GI tract. Okay, it's a turkey. It has infarcts and cyanosis of the head, the neck. We have facial edema, bacterial disease of the cardiovascular system that is best known in turkeys, but we see in a number of other species is erysipelothrix ruseopathy. Erysipelothrix ruseopathy is a, a bacterium which becomes systemic within the vascular system often causing thrombosis and hemorrhage in affected birds, especially turkey. We've already talked about it once, causing uh, uh, endocarditis and, and uh, vegetative valvular endocarditis, but in turkeys, they get very sick. You can see tremendous cyanosis. Look at this picture from Federico Giannini showing the cyanosis of a bird dying acutely with uh, with erysipelothrix. They can die acutely due to hemorrhages, due to widespread microthrombosis within vessels. I like erysipelothrix because a lot of times you can see the uh, in the areas of infarction in the vessels, you can actually see the bacteria on, on special stains. And then you can also see lesions in a multitude of, uh, of agents. You get both acute and chronic cases. They all don't die acutely. Sometimes you get the animals with large infarctions of the snood. This is a bacteria that can also be spread by fighting. So if the male turkeys are fighting, they can inoculate each other. Here are uh, a very enlarged spleen with areas of necrosis, a, uh, an area, uh, areas of necrosis and infarction within the liver as well. Um, there's a number of species that can be infected with erysipelothrix ruseopathy, resulting in, uh, um, in septicemia and occasionally infarcts in the skin. Uh, bottlenose dolphins get it, um, and they will have infarctions much like, uh, like poultry. Dogs can be infected. They tend to get the valvular endocarditis as well. It can be a significant pathogen in swine resulting in uh, septicemic form um, uh, and classic diamondback disease. So it's one of the agents that causes cutaneous infarcts in a wide number of species and always somewhat rewarding when you look at it under the microscope. Uh, this is a recent uh, image from uh, VetPath within the last uh, five or six years. And this was from an outbreak of mortality in a uh, mixed species uh, aviary containing cytosines, which was associated with uh, erysipelothrix ruseopathy. We have thrombosis, myocarditis as part of the septicemia, and this very large uh, liver, which uh, had amyloid in it. So wide range of species, Microthrombosis in multiple organs as a result of septicemia always consider the possibility of erysipelothrix ruseopathy. Okay, well, we have covered the, uh, the heart and the cardiovascular system, some of these uh, agents we're going to see in other lectures, and uh, I look forward to our next lecture on uh, pathology of the respiratory system of avian species. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you'll come back for that one or maybe look at some of the other lectures that are available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Till next time, have a great day.